So, greetings, everyone. Hi, everyone. My name is Nehid Mansour, and I'm the Senior Manager of Programs at the Gardner Museum. Welcome to the fourth iteration of our Three Works program. Today, our featured artist is Azil Sadiq, whose work Measure of One is part of the Raw Exhibition, which is currently on view in the Gardner Museum's Exhibition Gallery. Azza will be in conversation with Sequoia Miller, the Gardner Museum's chief curator and curator of RAW. Before we begin, you will notice your mics and videos are muted and the chat option has been disabled. However, there will be a Q&A following their conversation, and so we invite you to send us questions through the Q&A function at any point. Also, please note that this program is being recorded and live streamed through Facebook Live. I'd also like to acknowledge that Toronto is located on the treaty lands and ancestral territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Pitoon, and the Mississaugas of the Credit Nation. The community we work in is the home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to learn and live on this land. So thank you for joining us. I am very excited to listen to Aza and Sequoia's conversation today as they discuss Aza's work in relationship to the concept of absence. I'll now turn off my video and mic and hand it over to Sequoia. Great, thank you, Nahed. Uh, and thank you, Aza, for being here. Wonderful to see you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, also for joining us um, for our Three Works presentation with Aza. Really excited to be able to speak about her work um, with her and ask her some questions. Uh, I'll start off by introducing Aza, and then we'll um, bring up some images and look at some of Aza's work. Asa El Sadiq was born in Khartoum, Sudan. She received an MFA from Yale University School of Art in 2019 and a BFA from Ontario College of Art and Design University, or OCADU, in 2014. Asa was a participant at the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture in Maine in 2019. Her past exhibitions include Begin in Smoke and in Ashes at the Helena Unrather Gallery in New York, let Me Hear You Sweat at Cooper Cole Gallery here in Toronto, and Material Tells at the Oakville Galleries in, in Oakville, Ontario. Oz's work is also included uh, in the exhibition Raw, which is um, actually now on view at the, at the Gardner Museum, which is really fabulous to be able to say that it's on view. So the Gardner Museum, of course, like all museums in Ontario and in many places, has been closed for a number of months, but we're very excited to be reopening our doors. So just this week, we're starting to reopen uh, for some members as we get um, get all of our procedures finalized and this weekend we'll be opening to the public on Saturday the 11th. Uh, we have a free weekend plan so if you're in the area please do come in and see the gardener and you can see Oz's work which we will be talking about today. So again welcome Oz, great to see you. Thank you so much Sequoia and thank you for the introduction Nahid. Great, let me share the screen again so we can start um, seeing some images of your work. Everyone. Okie doke, so hopefully now everyone um, is able to see uh, the piece called Measure of One um, by Aza. And this is in fact the artwork that is on view at the Gardner. Um, so we'll be speaking about three of Aza's works today, um, again on this theme of absence. So Aza, as we're starting to look at, um, at Measure of One, at this image, which sort of encompasses the overall piece, um, one thing we're seeing are some empty shelves. So um, thinking about the absence, uh, the idea of absence, maybe you can describe a bit of what's happening in this work and what, what the viewers are seeing. Yeah, so in Measure of One, um, it's this installation that I created based on um, a sun ritual temple by Terhaga, who is a Nubian uh, pharaoh that ruled both Egypt and Sudan. And within the entrance of the temple, this stairway has this really um, important funerary text um, called the Litany of Ray. And that consists of uh, 75 manifestations of the God Ray. So I was thinking about this idea um, of like ascending and descending and how um, within these texts, they're all, they all consist of um, 
of rejuvenation of life. So essentially that's why the structure um, is created in this like stairway platform. And in the center column, there are, there'll be, there's in total, this installation has 75 vessels, but it consists of um, a duration of 25 vessels at a time that slowly through a, a slow drip irrigation system ends up dissolving um, a, a row at a time. So it's essentially one drop that ends up permeating each row of vessels. And, um, and then once the, once each 25 vessel has um, their duration, they get moved on to the side shelves and um, some of them end up completely disintegrating and breaking down while others are still intact but in sort of like disarray. Um, yeah, and with that, I was thinking about how the idea, like the measure of one, the idea of one drop that could end up like creating this ripple effect of, um, of like history, memories, and loss, and what is left behind, and what isn't left behind. I love that you bring the word um, duration into this too. I think one of the one of the really um, interesting or compelling aspects for me, both of this work and especially how you're um, using clay in this work, which is of course kind of the focus of the exhibition, given the gardener uh, is a museum of ceramics, is. Um, thinking about duration and the, and the notion that raw clay can be durational, that it can be um, time-based in a sense. So this, uh, this question of presence or absence or memory is uh, in some ways it's not a static one, right? You're, you're thinking of it as a, as, a, as a process of becoming or, or unbecoming in a way of like a becoming absent or becoming present. Yeah, and this also, thinking of the idea of absence, it's something that stays with you. Um, so in this way, how these um, vessels transform, um, thinking also about ideas of entropy, of how this like transformation moves into other materials, how then it becomes uh, part of the water system, how the water system these particles are embedded and then they continue in this like cyclical loop of essentially um, compounding onto the vessels that are still there as well as like breaking down. So in their absence, they're still there, but in just a different form. Wow. So it's like the energy of the, of the, of the thing or of the piece or of the material maybe is part of the presence of its material, regardless of what physical state it's in. Mm -hmm. Would that be fair to say? Yeah. yeah. Um, so entropy is a, is a great term to kind of bring into the, <laughs> into the conversation. So how would you, how do you define entropy or how, I mean, you've spoken a bit about how you think about it in this work, but I wonder if you could expand on that because I think it's an unfamiliar term for a lot of folks. Yeah. I think about like entropy, um, like a lot of my work has consisted about thinking about mortality and essentially like where do we go when we pass away and specifically looking at, um, looking at funerary text and temples and looking at these systems that, um, one reason why I focus on Egyptian and Nubian funerary text is because they have the most comprehensive um, thoughts about how we traverse the afterlife um, in order to be regenerated and reborn. And so thinking about that, I guess I began during grad school to really like question those things and creating these systems and structures has like helped me um, understand how, because one thing is that energy 
is always there. It just like takes a different form. And um, this idea of like watching objects transform and being able to have like, um, to kind of understand the poetics and just in general, how, how these materials are um, reshaping themselves that are still there. I'm thinking about this, the idea of a container. Um, the, the form that you're working with is a sort of base form, I would say, or um, clearly a vessel or a container form. It has a hollow center. Um, in the in the artwork, um, the you know the base of the piece has a number of tanks, um, some of which circulate water and some of don't, some of which don't, uh, and so those are vessels and containers too. I'm curious about this idea of the sort of the retention of the presence of a thing after its physical manifestation is gone, but while the energy might still be present, um, and this sort of connected to the idea of containment or of holding or of a, of a vessel or of something that's sort of held together versus diffuse. Do you, do you see the, I don't know what the question is that I have here particularly, yeah. but do you see the, do you see the container part of it or the holding part of it um, as integral to this, um, to this notion of energy? Yeah, I think so very much. Um, I think I keep remembering um, about when you presented the exhibition uh, during the opening night and how you talked of it about clay as being of the earth and what is beneath us. So within my research, um, I do read a lot of anthropology as well as mythology and thinking about how ancient Egyptians, as well as African mythology, believe that the god that created humans was a potter. And so taking those, um, taking those like, which I think is like very poetic of how we make um, meaning of life. And essentially that's how like the vessel form consists in my work and the containers of water is also from ancient Egyptian um, beliefs that the gods originated from the waters of primordial waters of men and how, but within these, it's like, I'm thinking about these like consistent links in ways and how that idea that the gods came from water is also it's not that far off from like the theory of evolution of how us humans came from water um so those are kind of the within my research like the seminal points that i'm trying that i'm that i find myself looking for within mm. Mm -hmm. Mm. that's so interesting that um you know i love that you're bringing these questions of mythology and spirituality um into the conversation and into the work, of course, and looking at the overall image, I think one of the great tensions in it is the is the tension between a sort of mythological and spiritual um, aspect, and then also this very sort of rational aspect or the kind of geometric aspect, which mm -hmm. is um, evokes a little bit of kind of like modern sculpture or minimalism. It's it's a very sort of hard edge, and um, and I'm wondering how you think about that connection between the sort of spiritual and the mythological on the one hand and the sort of hard edge or rational or sort of conversation within modern art um, or sculpture. Yeah, um, I mean, when I use materials, they're very specific. So um, using the steel within my work especially the square tubing, like I am thinking about institutional frameworks and thinking about uh, religion and spirituality and so on within those frameworks and how um, these ideas are also essentially very ephemeral, but then they hold so much weight for us. So this idea of like stripping them down um, 
and just realizing, although they are very sturdy in like the capacity, in some sort of capacity, that they're also very uh, fragile in the same space where that essentially you could kick it over. Um, so yeah, within these like, like the structures that I create tend to speak to the ideas of institutional frameworks. I, I love this subject of institutional frameworks and I feel like it's so important right now as so many of us who are framed by institutions <laughs> or within institutional frameworks are thinking about what those frames do to us basically and, and what they've done to us and where they have access points and where they don't. Um, I'm wondering given all of, so you were in Toronto, um, the show opened in, in March and um, for folks who are watching, Aza was here kind of finishing the work in Toronto and installing it on site right at the beginning of March and then or I guess late February and then um, and then went back to uh, back to the US and the show was open for about a week and then we closed because of the COVID um, pandemic. So. Um, since you were here in town, of course, the pandemic has um, happened, and then all of the protests um, in the U.S. and around the world uh, around Black Lives Matter and around um, many questions of racial inequalities. Um, there, there's, of course, been a very um, active conversation in museum spaces around what this has meant in the past and what it could mean moving forward. So I'm wondering on this subject of institutional frameworks, if you're, maybe even if how you see this work in particular, or if you're thinking about your work more broadly, um, has shifted in the last little span of time here, uh, you know, in relation to this idea of institutional frameworks, or how you yeah. see your work, your work functioning in these, in these spaces. Yeah, um, I actually, I also really appreciated the post that you had made about seeing the work in this new light um, that essentially these are sort of like bodies in this kind of prison system of sorts. Um, so I think that's something that tends to be bypassed in my work. And I really appreciated that you were able to see that because in this way, um, I, had, I had talked about this idea of fairness um, that how these systems, when I was young, I had always questioned fairness, like why do some people have to endure more suffering than others? And um, within these systems, how I've also seen them is that thinking about them in this way where um, the vessels that are closer to the water systems that end up getting eroded is kind of in the same framework of how um, these structures um, operate. That the further away um, from, I guess, yeah, like the further away that you are from like the water droplets, like the, the better chance that you have at this like, um, this like idea of not necessarily like a better life, but like a system that protects you in some sort of way. So it is something that um, I have like thought about a lot. <laughs> mm. It's great to think about that also within the context of what you were describing um, earlier around the sort of that the form may change or even disappear or dissolve, say entirely, but the energy is still there. Yeah. So what, you know, the exposure to the droplets, say in this case, or the water can have, um, it can impact the, the presence or the absence in some dimensions, but maybe not all dimensions, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, I think we should maybe, uh, like, I, we could spend a long time talking about this yeah, work, yeah. but I think... <laughs> Some of the folks might want to see some of the other yeah. pieces. Um, so this is a detail of an artwork called Concave, Conflux, Convex. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll show the other image that we have of this piece too. Um, and uh, maybe starting with this image, um, I would ask you about the 
this subject of absence um, by thinking about the um, the image of the person that we're seeing here. So this this piece looks like it has a photographic element to it, and there's a representation of a person. So thinking about how you um, how you choose to to have uh, bodies be present in your work versus absent, and how you were thinking about it in this piece. Yeah, I think that like with this piece, I was thinking also about these structural systems. I was thinking a lot about the diasporic Sudanese women in the communities that I had grown up with and how a lot of these women were like very educated in Sudan. They held positions where um, they were, they had their PhDs, they were doctors and so on. And then once they came to Canada, they ended up working in spaces um, like um, a cashier at, um, you know, Safeway or No Frills or, um, or McDonald's and so on. So I was just thinking about like the idea of the immigrant mother um, mm -hmm. and the sacrifices of coming to a new country but then being in a space that won't necessarily accept you. So um, in this, uh, uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, more details. So I was working with these classic vessels and then I was splitting them in half and creating these um, other forms of classic forms of vessels and since it's raw clay on glass, they end up drying and cracking and breaking off. So this idea of attempting to conform to this system that doesn't essentially like want you there. Mm -hmm. Or have space in a way, or it can contain in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, I, I love how you use raw clay, it's so, it's so great. So I'm wondering how, I mean, as somebody, I don't think you really think of yourself as being like a ceramic artist particularly. So I'm wondering kind of how you got started, um, started using the, the medium. Yeah, um, I've always had an affinity to materials. I think, well, my father is a scientist. So um, I think this idea of like research and material exploration has been embedded in me and also uh, my late brother who also did a lot of material research but focused on paintings. Um, so I, and also during my time at undergrad, I spent my thesis uh, doing doing uh, material exploration. So I was able to create this material vocabulary. Um, and then I really started working with clay uh, when I was doing my residency at Harborfront because I was in the textile studio, um, but I really gravitated towards clay. Um, yeah, and then since then. But I don't, um, it's, I think there's a lot of really meaningful poetics that come through me with like the idea of clay. And I, and I think that is um, something that holds my interest, but then at the same time, I'm not necessarily tethered to in this way that it's mainly uh, more about the concept for me and how those materials can speak to those concepts. Um, but yeah, so far we've had a really great love affair. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way to put it. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> you're actually speaking to one of the questions that we've had from, um, from one of the participants who's uh, Magdalene Dixter, who's one of the other artists in the uh, exhibition. So hi Magdalene. And Magdalene's asking about this balance between academic research and material experimentation. And so in, in a way you've kind of been speaking to that. Um, and I love this idea of science and love affair sort of happening together at the same time. I wonder like 
how do you how do you think about research in this context like what what for you what activities include encompass research in your in your thinking yeah um for me research what activities um well it could be like material research um, and that's just essentially um, getting to know material and ideas about like, well, what if I do this or what if I do that? Um, and then there's like the academic research that really uh, spurs and is kind of the foundation of my work. But one thing, and then also like mythology and I, do, I love reading fiction and I think a huge part of that is the it, it comes in as this like world building so essentially taking like this really um, looking at like kind of rigid academic papers and then reimagining um, these ideas in a way that I'm creating a world that speaks to that I love that idea of world, world building. It's so great to bring that into the conversation because that's totally what you're doing as an artist, but it's really cool to hear you relate to that from, um, from like a literary perspective, thinking about fiction, but then also a sort of a scientific or an academic perspective too. Um, <clears throat> and I'm thinking, so one thing we share is that we both um, have spent some time at Yale, uh, <laughs> you in an MFA and me in a PhD program. Yeah. And one of the things that, um, it was a complicated time for, for being there, but one of the things that was uh, interesting for me was sort of what, what it felt like and what was possible at a big university and at a wealthy university too, where there were just like tons of resources and folks yeah. around. Um, and, and I'm wondering how you've, if you could speak to um, kind of how, it, how, do you, how do you feel it's impacted your work? Not so much the art school part of it or the school of art part of it, but more just the like, being in like a big research university kind of environment did did that kind of shift your thinking about research or the role of research in your work or what kind of conversations you could yeah I, in? I mean it was really about um access you know access to the libraries access to classes um and yeah so that was really amazing just being able to essentially um, have a lot of things available at your fingertips. And um, so I feel being there has really um, was able to um, let me expand my practice. And then and then just also within the community, being able to, I know everyone was really busy, so it was like hard to track down people, but <laughs> right. it, while I was there, um, I got to work at the Digital Humanities uh, Laboratory. Um, I've been, it's a little bit on pause at the moment, but I've been interested in machine learning so I got a rapid prototyping grant and they had helped me. They essentially set this like machine learning program for, up for me and taught me how to use it in order to um, generate some work out of that. Um, I was also able to get in touch with someone in the chemistry department that broke down the chemical agents for one of the scents that I was using. Um, so. Yeah, it was really, um, it was amazing to um, have so much access to things while being there. Wow. Interesting to think about access within the subject of institutional frameworks too, because so much, I mean, there's so many, it's such a fraught subject, sort of like of this question of access and like sort of who has it and when and under what conditions and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Um, so you've, I want to go to the, um, to this, and actually, you know what, maybe, so this is the third work that, um, that you brought, that you brought today, Begin in Smoke, End in Ashes, part two. <clears throat> and as a way to start talking about this work, um, 
I think I'd like to ask you to speak about the, this, um, this idea of absence with, um, in relation to place or in relation to culture in some way. Mm -hmm. You've spoken a few times about Sudan and about Egypt and about um, both ancient culture and mythology. And of course, you were born in, born in Sudan, um, have lived in Canada and the U.S. for some time now. I'm, I'm wondering what sort of what is if you could speak to this question of presence or absence of, um, of, of Sudan, maybe, or of Sudanese yeah. culture for you? Yeah, I think, um, I think a lot of that plays within the scent component that I use within my work. Um, there's two different scents that I work with. One is the before, I think it's on the next slide. Yeah, which is being activated by a heat lamp. And that scent reminds me of the diasporic Sudanese women that I had grown up. And um, thinking about these women and pillars in society that are unrecognized. So the idea of their absence within histories, um, but when used in the space, um, it's really uh, powerful and potent. Um, and so then it ends up embedding itself uh, into the walls, into the viewers. Um, so that, that's one of the scents. And the other scent that I use is um, called Sandalea, uh, which is used during uh, Muslim burial in the way of preparing the body. Um, so thinking about, not only about the care that we give to the body, but also um, the absence of life. So the sort of undulation between life and death within that installation. Within this installation in particular, the... Yeah. Yeah. Um, I hope everyone who's listening um, caught what, what you just <laughs> described, because it's pretty, it's pretty incredible. Like I love, it's kind of mind blowing. So the visualization of um, of the of diasporic Sudanese women through the through the object of the scent and then of the incense, I guess, and then the activation and so the fragrance in the space, and then the way that that embeds itself into um, or sort of diffuses within the air and then embeds itself within the entire within the entire space. It's, to me, that's pretty incredible. That's a pretty phenomenal way to be thinking about. Um, memory and and presence and absence. Thank you. Wow, it's great. I guess that's. <clears throat> I guess that makes me a <laughs> fan. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, one, one question I have actually about mm -hmm. about the scent again is um, is thinking about this question of visualization. And so how how did with with these ideas in your head of sort of ways of maybe recognizing the presence of these of these women. How, and that scent might be a way to do that. How did you come to how you wanted the, the visual representation of that to occur? Or mm -hmm. So the image that we're looking at has like a welded, like a steel elbow. It has the square tubing that you've spoken to a bit earlier. And then this clamp on light and it's red. Sort of how, how did the kind of visual elements of that, of that work for you? I think, I guess I'm asking as a sculptor. Yeah. Well, I think for me, it's like, I'm always trying to capture these ephemeral moments. So within this structure, it's not, I mean, everything plays its part, but it's really, um, it was really about watching that uh, piece of before burn. And it was about watching how that, um, how that scent and that smoke diffuse within that space and how it just lingered and kind of, um, yeah, how it was like the way it navigated. And, um, and I think that was essentially, it's kind of like setting up these systems that generate um, a happening. Um, so I feel and I, and I spend a lot of time in my head before I execute anything. So um, yeah, it just begins to materialize in my head. So, and then it just takes form. Yeah. 
That's great. It, that so the that phrase of materializing in your head sort of brings brings back this question of um, of sort of energetic presence rather than physical presence, right? It's like the idea is there as an idea, and it has um, co it has presence really as an idea, and then obviously it matters whether or not become it becomes physical or sort of realized in the physical realm, but it doesn't mean that it's non-existent when it's just um, when it's present in your head, right? Um, so I would encourage uh, folks to keep um, sending in some questions. We're getting some great questions. I'm going to get to them in just one sec. Um, but the, uh, so please continue to send some more. One one question that I would ask the Waza is um, in the beginning smoke and in ash piece, ashes pieces that we're looking at here. Can you speak to the um, the the objects that are on the sort of red decking there and what um, sort of how you chose them and what they signify to you. And then as, as an aspect of that, also this question of color, because there's um, typically you're, in your other pieces, there's not a lot of kind of chromatic um, variation. And here you have red, which is clearly a very intentional choice. So I'd love for you to speak to both the objects that you picked and your use of color in here. Yeah, um, so the objects that I picked, I usually create my own, own molds. Uh, but for this piece, I actually, um, I found the objects or the molds on eBay. So I was specifically looking at objects that had, um, that were linked to ideas of religious beliefs um, or spirituality. So that's how I went about choosing them. Um, and I was thinking in this way of, the objects within the space, ideas of uh, uh, oral histories and creation myth stories. So just um, working with that idea. And then the color actually came, uh, I took an ancient, ancient Egyptian afterlife class at Yale and we had went to the Peabody where we got to see some tombs. And one of the first, um, so one of the first religious texts that was, um, that kind of spurred the idea of the Amduit, which is like this longer funerary text. Uh, it's called the Book of Two Ways. And on that um, tomb coffin, it had um, these red lines and black lines as a way to navigate the afterlife. And also the tank um, is actually an architectural blueprint of, um, of like the architecture of the funerary temple. So yes, that's what I was um, thinking about when I created that piece. <laughs> Cool. <laughs> that's really yeah. great. And I, I love that you could take a class in the Egyptian afterlife. That's really, yeah, that's really, it was really great. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, let me see. I'm going to scroll back a bit here to measure of one again, maybe this other image. Um, and we've had a question um, uh, about the role of water in the works. And so the questioner is asking that, um, you know, signaling that you've spoken to this kind of fact of the um, of the clay disappearing and that the particles mix in with water, but they're um, interested in um, you speaking more about the the role of water in the both in this work and in the other works. Mm -hmm. Well, I feel like I had talked about how um, the water in the work is a reference to the primordial waters um, and and also yeah and also I guess maybe maybe I can uh, expand on like the one drop of water but like this idea of a uh, ripple effect and a uh, fracturing that also how, how like that water in a way is something that's hard to contain, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but can 
in some way be contained. Um, but yeah, I, I think that like my, my interest in water specifically comes from the, from it being from like the ancient Egyptians ideas and how that's linked, how that links to um, the theory of evolution. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't feel like I answered that quite properly, <laughs> but. <laughs> no, not at all, no, that's great. Um, but, but you have brought in this, brought in the question of, um, of evolution and the theory of evolution. I'm wondering, like, how, how do you, I guess, what do you see, the, what do you see as the connection between water, ancient Egyptian theories of uh, afterlife or practices um, and, and the idea of, of evolution? Yeah, well, I think like, it's just, it's interesting that civilizations uh, working with the ideas of religion have acknowledged the importance of water in this way, that it's essentially like the life giver and that we need it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that how, <laughs> and how we're made up of water as well, you know, so, it's, so I guess it is sort of this play on like water and earth, you know, and like the body being of the earth but um, also, also within that, it's like water has a huge part to play in that. Mm. Cool, thank you for that. Um, we, we have another question about labor and um, sort of the act of making in your work. And um, the, the questioner is noting that you're working with raw clay, that objects dissolve, so you have to sort of manufacture or make um, a number of them, but it's not something that, um, <clears throat> that, like as an artist, that you can then, that's easy to, um, you know, it's not like a static object uh, that can be put into a collection so easily. Um, so the, um, the viewer is questioning whether you can help us understand this decision toward ephemerality and how that functions within the art world. Yeah. You know, it's things that I'm still trying to figure out and navigate, but I know that for myself, um, I've always, it's always been about art for me and like pushing the boundaries of art and how we understand art. So I, I think that's the most important thing for me. And that's um, what I, essentially what I signed up for. <laughs> and, that's, and that's the thing that excites me. So I haven't, um, yeah, and I think that's just where um, I want to keep my focus on mm -hmm. um, pushing those boundaries, not only, um, but like mainly within my practice. You know, so this is sort of me as the art historian nerd kind of coming through, but one of the things that really stands out to me about your work is that that has come up um, just in this conversation is its connection to 1960s minimalism, right, which we talked about. You used the word happening when you um, were speaking about the incense and fragrance, about the scent and the fragrance. Um, and now with the subject of ephemerality that also calls to mind, of course, conceptual artists from the 60s and 70s who were working in sort of ephemeral um, idioms where there wasn't like a, a static object. And in some, in a really compelling way, you sort of synthesize all of these kind of um, major streams of uh, kind of avant-garde practice, kind of Western practice from the 60s and 70s, often male artists or the best known artists in those idioms. And you've totally like brought them together and, and had them be sort of these integrated elements to your work where you're not sort of in this very overt way, you know, referencing these works or ripping off of them, but they're completely sort of like internalized and in, in a way and has become something that's really um, of yourself. It's, it's a really great, um, a really uh, compelling and, and uh, an interesting synthesis that 
that I think we're all looking at. So as the art historian, just want to call that out. You're probably <laughs> less interested in that aspect no. of it. <laughs> no, thank you. Yeah. Um, so we have another question. Uh, we have just a couple minutes left, but I want to get in a couple more questions. We have one question, um, of, I think, from somebody who may have known you early on because they're asking about your textile work and yeah. textiles dipped in paint. Uh -huh. um, and kind of calling out that that paint has the quality of a clay slip. And so the question is whether you see yourself reintroducing textiles as part of your vocabulary. I mean, um, like I had mentioned, um, like the material is the concepts, the most important thing that I focus on. So if I do find myself gravitating back towards textiles, um, like it's possible. Um, but I'm just essentially just kind of focusing on what interests me at the moment that can speak to the things that I'm thinking about. So stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what's next? <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Okay, last question that we have from the from the crowd is a and that we'll take today is a is a kind of a personal question in a way, um, which is uh, what are your what are your personal beliefs around afterlife? What's your thinking around afterlife? Yeah, yeah. Um, I believe in energy, and I think these um, these installations that I've created help me um, think about after uh, like the afterlife um, and spirituality. I grew up Muslim um, and, and then I always had personal questions about organized religion. Um, so for myself, I found that like the thing that holds, I think there's like uh, certain principles within religion about being a good human being, taking care of others, but I didn't necessarily feel like I needed um, a, an organized religion in order to be that as a human being. And what I felt really resonated with me is the idea of um, energy transferring. Wow, that's a beautiful place to end. I believe in energy. I think that's a great thing for, for all of us to take take with us. Um, and with that, I'll thank you, Aza, for um, spending the time with us today. And thank you for your work, um, both at The Gardener and elsewhere. It's it's really wonderful. To, thank you so um, much. Speak to you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, everyone who's watching, I want to remind you that um, that Oz's work is uh, is on view if you're a member of or a friend of the Gardener um, this week and on this weekend will be open to the public starting on Saturday the 11th. We have a free admission weekend. Um, we've got lots of measures in place to keep everyone safe um, and help you stay healthy uh, while you visit the museum. So you can feel confident coming in Saturday and Sunday again are free and after that we're looking to stay open um, regular hours as long as we can so you can come back and actually see Oz's piece um, change over time. It'll be in the exhibition raw. We don't have a hard closing date at this point but likely into November and um, and these shelves that you see here will, um, will uh, fill up over time with manifestations of raw. So I hope you can join us and thank you again Aza. Um, it's been really great talking to you and Great uh, getting to know more about your work. So thank you. Thank everyone. Be well, everybody. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>